So what does this talk about? Um, so in this talk, I want to introduce why we actually need ethical machine learning. And uh, the title of my talk is Machine Learning Bias In, Bias Out, and which means that if we apply machine learning on data, which is biased, then we can also expect that the outcome might be biased. And um, I will show some techniques how to avoid this. But uh, first, uh, as Jeffrey already introduced, machine learning is used everywhere. Artificial intelligence is used everywhere. Uh, the benefits are very clear. Uh, it's used in your spam detector, route planner, search engine results, automatic translation, tax fraud detection. Um, so there are many uh, very good applications of uh, data mining. And here, of course, I'm preaching a bit to the choir, um, but uh, you, we are all convinced that it has many very nice applications. Um, just to give an example of the benefits, and for those who may be less familiar with AI, um, here is an example of the Sci410 data set, where the task is to recognize uh, images and to do this as, as quickly as possible. And uh, for these neural networks can be trained that outperform humans. Uh, so you see some examples, uh, some small uh, images, uh, automobile, ship, bird, uh, in order to recognize that a human can do this 94% correctly to divide them into the 10 classes, uh, which is basically due to the resolution of the images being too low to always uh, clearly recognize it. And I imagine that a trained human can probably do about 100 of these images per minute. And that's already quite uh, optimistic. If you look at machine performance, and then we see the best performing model outperforms humans and by, uh, by far, and it can do thousands of images per second. Uh, apart from that, we also have the promise of machine learning. And for long, we believed that machine learning could beat human decision makers because human decision makers are they're susceptible to prejudice and bias. For instance, as some uh, stereotypes about gender or racial stereotypes that a, a human decision maker may hold. While if we apply machine learning, it's based on data, it's based on statistics. So it will be free from bias, uh, no longer gut feeling, but facts and statistics. It can also pick up patterns that are missed by humans, as we saw in the images uh, classification task, where we see that it can outperform uh, humans and it's not hindered by cultural stereotypes. So uh, all good news. However, it turns out uh, in many cases that models may unintentionally pick up and amplify bias from training data and uh, which leads to unintended effects. Um, so if your data may contain some cultural bias, machine learning algorithms will pick it up. And this is particularly problematic because we do not always know that our data has these problems and our models have millions of parameters. So they are no longer interpretable and cannot always be uh, explained very easily. Just a very small example of a case and where uh, things went wrong. So this is um, an example of a uh, um, supermarket in the United States where they use an uh, automated inventory system, probably not even AI, and, but due to automation and when they were trying to uh, empty the shelves, they were uh, lowering the price of products that were selling um, less than other products. And as a result, and they ended up with this particular situation where a black Barbie was sold at a much lower price than exactly the same Barbie, but then the white Barbie. Um, while this for the machine may have made perfect sense, maybe the black bar Barbies were not selling very well in that particular region. And this was actually causing quite some problems for the supermarket and quite some bad uh, publicity. Um, so why do we want to study discrimination-free classification or why do we want to remove this kind of bias from uh, our data? And this is not only because of reputation damage, but also because there are discrimination laws that do not always allow the use of attributes like ethnicity, gender, religion, and there is a whole list of sensitive attributes. And to illustrate how far this goes, that this is um, by now well known, but 10 years ago, this was rather impactful that insurance companies were no longer allowed to use gender of the insured individual as a risk factor for uh, insurance contracts. So especially for car insurance, and this had a big uh, influence because as we all know, males um, are more likely to have accidents than females, um, but no longer this was allowed to be used by the insurance companies. And the reason for that is that in, for a legal ground, 
uh, in order if you if you want to make predictions the correlations are fine but if you want to make decisions and they usually require causality and they require that the um, attributes on which you make the decision they have a, a genuine impact on uh, the outcome and so here in this case it's not the case for the in, for our insurance example because being male or female is not a direct cause of uh, being a high risk and so even though it improves the accuracy of our algorithms we actually run into some uh, legal problems so does this happen in in reality is this really a problem and so i want to convince you by showing you uh, three examples three recent examples in which there was some bias uh, in the data or at least in the decision procedures that were learned by AI and that actually resulted in some problems for the companies uh, applying it. And the first example that I want to uh, show is of, about racial bias that was found by uh, a healthcare risk algorithm. So um, this is a case of 2019 and this is an algorithm that was used for more than 200 million patients in the United States. And the goal of this algorithm was to predict, based on the medical history of the patient, uh, whether they were, uh, would likely need ex extra medical care in future. And they would identify patients that would benefit from this high-risk uh, care in order to start some high-risk care management programs and give access to specially trained uh, nursing. Um, however, it turned out that this system that was trained on uh, historical data heavily favored white patients over black patients, while race wasn't even the variable in the decision procedure. So how does this come and what were the reasons? Um, so the goal is to look at the patient records and to predict the future needs of the patients in order to plan for special care uh, for the patients. And in order to do that, uh, uh, typically training data is being used uh, of patients of which we already know and their future. So we base ourselves um, on patient data from the past, um, their records as the way they looked five years ago, and then we know whether or not um, their needs, they have high uh, medical needs uh, in the period that dates after their uh, patient records. But uh, the future needs, and they were actually quite difficult to uh, get. So instead, they used the future cost as a proxy for future needs. And uh, using future cost as a proxy is makes a lot of sense and because this is data that is easily accessible uh, most of the time that's very well uh, recorded by the hospital that doesn't have all these uh, problems of ambiguity that we may have uh, with future needs and we need to classify um, how, how much needy someone is based on the uh, uh, health care he receives and then the reasoning behind it is that there is a health condition an underlying health condition that is reflected in the patient record and also in future health interventions and these future health interventions they are associated with the uh, future cost. And so instead of learning a classifier that goes from the patient record to the future needs and they learn a um, classifier goes from the patient records to the future cost used as a proxy for these uh, future needs. However, one thing they overlooked in this uh, system is that actually ethnicity turns out to be correlated with the future need interventions of a person and also with the future costs. So um, how is this explained? And, uh, based on ethnicity, black people were, for instance, more likely to uh, take more direct um, healthcare actions, like going to the uh, emergency unit, while the uh, white patients in the data were more likely to go uh, take preventive uh, actions, for instance. And for the future costs, and this is associated with the uh, average income of the patients, um, which was lower for the black patients than for the white patients, uh, which made and that they uh, were more likely to search for interventions in hospitals that were less uh, costly. Apart from that, apparently ethnicity was also reflected in the patient records, maybe by the region where they were living, um, or the hospitals they went to, maybe types of interventions they, they uh, chose for, was also reflected there. And as a result, and the whole procedure became uh, biased and because the, even though the future needs were not necessarily uh, biased, by using the future cost as a predictor for the future needs, 
they introduce the bias based on ethnicity. Um, and so how bad was this um, bias? And so um, if they looked at patients that were classified as very high risk, the black individuals turned out to have 26.3% uh, uh, more chronic illnesses than the white uh, patients, which means that um, for the white patients and more patients with less severe conditions were in this uh, very high risk category and uh, the black patients were uh, underrepresented there. So this was absolutely not an intention of the people that developed the algorithm. And this was just a result of the fact of using the healthcare cost history as a proxy for the future health needs, which turned out to be uh, correlated with the ethnicity. So this is uh, something that we call uh, a label bias. And so the way that the label is recorded, in this case, the proxy for the label uh, is biased with respect to our uh, sensitive attributes. Um, so the, the authors of this study pointing out these uh, problems, this racial bias, they also made some uh, conclusions. And I think it's really important to realize these conclusions. Um, the first one is that the point of the study was not to discourage the use of AI. Because very often when people talk about fairness and algorithmic fairness and automatic decision procedures, there is this connotation of uh, the danger of AI, and maybe we should avoid using AI in these kind of sensitive sectors. And here the authors may uh, make a very strong case um, in favor of using AI, and because as they say, there are, there are uh, thousands or, or millions of healthcare variables that need to be taken into account. And uh, using humans alone, we cannot do that. So we really need AI in order to get better predictions, in order to get uh, better management of these problems. But at the same time, and, and this, I think, is a takeaway message for uh, all of us, um, they were saying, OK, that they hope that one of the things that come out of their paper, about their study, is that people that are applying AI, um, that they would do a basic set of audits uh, to their algorithms, to their classification procedures before their uh, product will touch a uh, real patient. And I think this is a really important conclusion. This is one direction of research. If you look at fairness in machine learning, where people have been looking into. So given data, how can I measure if, if the data is biased or not? Uh, if I learn a decision, decision procedure, how can I estimate uh, whether this decision procedure is uh, biased or not? So this was the first case and making the claim and that we basically should look if we learn classifiers, then we should do the sanity check and see if there are no communities that are, have a, um, a that receive a disparate impact of the decision decision procedures that we build on top of the uh, classifiers that we learn. A second example and that uh, was also very present in the news is about Amazon, now, Amazon that was using at some point an AI recruitment tool. And this recruitment tool turned out to favor men for technical jobs over uh, women. So in, this is already from 2015. And then uh, Amazon realized that the algorithm they were using and they, were, they realized it themselves, it was again, not intent, intentional and that their algorithm was biased against women and they basically stopped uh, using it. And the example before the algorithm was adapted in order to remove the bias, in this case, and they uh, were not able to remove the bias. And so after a while, they, after trying, they just decided to uh, ditch the algorithm. And um, the algorithm was based on, again, on historical data a number of resumes submitted over the past 10 years. And uh, most of the applicants, as is usually the case for technical jobs, were men. And the system basically learned to favor men over women. And so probably not only most of the applicant, uh, applicants were men, but also of those that were hired, a higher proportion was male. Um, and then the algorithm picked that up, picked up this correlation and uses this, uses this correlation while uh, predicting. So um, it penalized resumes that included the word uh, women's, like women's chess clubs in, in the uh, hobby section of the CV. Uh, it even actively downgraded some uh, all women's uh, colleges. So again, and there is no direct discrimination. It's not that the classifier picks up the correlation, uh, sees that, okay, um, it's a male, so I will upgrade it. It's a female, I will downgrade the score for this participant. Uh, instead, 
it uh, learned this indirectly based on some other characteristics and then based on correlations that were exploited in the end uh, females were um, negatively affected by our classifier so how does this bias creep into this type of of, uh, of classifiers and uh, so i want to elaborate a little bit more on uh, this example uh, by looking at word embeddings and so in in amazon screening the cvs they were working with uh, textual data and uh, when working with textual data um, one technique that's very often used is to uh, represent words and text as uh, vectors of numbers. And the reasons are obvious. A text is unstructured. Uh, we cannot directly learn a classifier. We cannot le learn directly a linear classifier on uh, a CV. Before we do that, and we need to turn the words into numbers. And then with the numbers, we can do uh, our usual arithmetic, learn our neural networks, uh, linear classifiers, whatever. And the idea is, uh, so we have our different words. We learn a vector of numbers. Um, and, and this is used as an adapter in order to be able to use our uh, words and our text in a uh, regular classifier. Now, uh, these words, these embeddings, they are not random. Um, and the words that are used in similar context should have similar vectors. So that is the idea. And so here I've made a mock-up example where I have divided different words into two uh, dimensions. And one dimension is, is this a word that you say about food or is it a word that you will say about people? And on the uh, vertical axis, you see if it's a negative or a positive word. Uh, if we do that manually, and then we can give different words, different positions, and we can use these positions, words that are near to each other and will have a similar semantic meaning. For instance, uh, intelligent and trustworthy are two very positive words that you can say about uh, humans. And this is usually not something that you will say about food. Uh, delicious is then something positive about food that you will not uh, easily use for uh, humans. And then uh, awful, rotten, this is maybe something that is more common to also use for uh, people, uh, but is very negative and still and uh, most likely to be said about food. So this is the idea. And we want to divide our words. We want to give them a uh, position. And now the crux of all these techniques that are being used uh, is that these things are learned from data. So we, that it, there is not someone that will manually um, think up some dimensions and will put the words there and similar words uh, will end up together. No, and the idea is that we'll learn this automatically from uh, data. And the idea is to use a whole lot of texts that are available. Uh, for instance, I think one of the first ones were trained on uh, Google News where they just took um, news articles from a very long period of time. And, um, but, but this is of course unlabeled data. And we need to learn one way or another a representation of the words. And, and this is done by basically turning the problem into a game and then learning an algorithm that can play this game very well. And the game that we are learning um, to play is the game Guess the Word. And so basically what we will do is we will take sentences or we will take snippets of the text and we will um, mask some of the words. And then we, we try to predict that word. That is a task that we want to learn uh, using our neural nets or uh, machine learning techniques. For instance, here we have a sentence, a Florida man charged for assault with a deadly weapon after throwing something into Wendy's drive through And so, and basically based on the context of the words, and some words that are in front, some words that are behind, we try to predict which words uh, should go here in the middle. Um, it has a lot of advantages. It's very easy to generate test data. We just take uh, the texts and uh, let's say that we take two context words uh, in front, two context words behind, and then we have the word that we want to predict, a Florida man, and then the word that is charged uh, for assault. And so our input is Florida man for an assault. So that's basically the task that we want to learn. And um, the structure of the model to learn this task will be fixed and will basically look like this. So we take our different words, two words in front, two words behind. So these are context words. We will learn a model that maps it to numbers. Well, it's not really a model. It's more like a lookup table. And then these numbers should allow a second model that we learn to predict what is our context word. 
So here in this particular case, and the word that we want to predict is charged. So we want to basically train a model, two models and one representation, and then another model we're training them uh, jointly in order to be able to perform this task very well. So uh, while having no uh, training, no um, supervised training data, and this is turned into a supervised problem, we have lots and lots and lots of data, so we can easily train good model one and uh, model two. And so basically the idea is that here, and this model one will be used for all the words, um, and e each word will get a, a vector, but these vectors are too small to uh, contain all the information because a very easy solution would be to use a one-hot encoding. We just make the dimensionality of our vectors as large as the um, number of words that there are in the English language or that are used in our news articles. We just put a one in the position. Every word is associated with a position. We put a one if it's that word and a zero in all the other positions. And But of course, the crucial part is that we will apply some dimensionality reduction here implicitly by making this a much smaller dimensionality. In this example, dimensionality four, in reality, it will be more like 300 uh, uh, dimensional vector that we will be uh, using. And then it's an optimization problem. Right? So we want to maximize our expected outcome. And so we have just a number of outcomes, probabilities that are associated with it. Uh, here it is a, a formula. We want to optimize the um, uh, correct outputs and we learn the models. After we have learned these models, we're actually only interested in this first model that assigns to our terms the uh, vector of numbers. And this is basically how our, um, in, in a nutshell, how embeddings uh, are being trained. And by making it in, to, into another task, in, uh, a task of predicting um, which word is missing based on some context words, uh, in order to do that, and first we transform each word in a representation. And this representation sh should be such that based on the representation of our context words, we can easily predict what the word in the middle will be about. And so what we see then automatically happening is that these vectors will store information that is important in order to predict what is the uh, word um, that is missing. And so this could be, for instance, the gender uh, of a word can be important. Uh, because if we are talking about uh, someone and uh, whether we are using he or she, this will be encode this this will typically be encoded there uh, because if we want to use a pronoun, it is important to know whether it's uh, male or female, uh, whether it's singular or uh, plural, uh, also more or less what is the context of the word? Is it a word about? Uh, sports, or is the word about uh, uh, politics. And so these are things that will typically get stored here, not intentionally, and, but because we are uh, automatically optimizing for this particular task. And, uh, and so our model will capture semantic information that allows to win the guessing game. Um, and this works extremely well. And so what you see here is um, uh, are the representations of different words. They have been projected on two dimensions and by taking the principal, the first two principal components. And here you see that if you look at the relation between different words, if, if, if different pairs of words are in a similar relation, then the difference in the vector positions will also tend to be similar. And so we have short, shorter, shortest. If you look at the differences between the vector of short and shorter, that is very similar as the difference in the vector between slow and slower. The same for slower and slowest, shorter, shortest. And so these are things that many of you probably already have seen uh, many times. Um, the same with gender, uh, uh, male and female versions of a word, man, woman, hear, hear us, sir and madam. And so typically these um, kind of semantic information is captured inside our vectors. And this also allows us uh, to do some kind of uh, vector arithmetic with uh, our words. So for instance, we can see, if you look at the difference between men and women, that's more or less the same as the difference between king and queen. So suppose that we know king and we want to have the female uh, variant of a king, then we can just subtract the vector of man and add the vector of woman, see which word is uh, nearest and that is very likely to be the word uh, queen. 
and it has amazing applications. So if you do sentiment analysis, the fact that we can encode our texts into a vector that has some semantic information, if you just look at the position where words end up, uh, if you see positive or negative words, um, they tend uh, to end up in similar positions and positive words, negative words. So this is uh, an example where positions have been trained on uh, tweets and uh, uh, things tend up to, uh, to be in the similar position if they have similar uh, meaning. And so if you want to do sentiment analysis, well, this is, this is the type of techniques to be used uh, in this context. However, uh, apart from that, it also uh, um, captures cultural biases. So this is a paper of uh, Bolg Basi and others that uh, actually found out. And basically what they were doing, and, and this is also in the, the title of their uh, paper. And so they, they also do this game of, okay, let's, let's find these anal analogies. And so man stands to woman like, and let's then take a typical male profession, computer programmer, well, what according to my embedding is the female equivalent uh, of that? And so you subtract the vector of male, you add the vector of uh, female, and then you see which word turns out. And it turns out that in that particular example, that particular experiment that they did, the word that came out is homemaker. And so this is a uh, very strong cultural bias based on the texts that these uh, were trained on. So they also saw some gender stereotypes and she, he analogies uh, where you have male and uh, female uh, variants and like, like sewing is typically associated with females, carpentry them with uh, males, uh, nurse and surgeon is another pair, uh, blonde burly. And there have been a lot of these types of experiments and also um, different types of experiments. Like for instance, where they try to do uh, completion um, of sentences and they, you, you say, okay, he works in a hospital, uh, he is A, and then um, the, the computer needs to complete the sentence. And there you see and that there is a lot of bias, which is uh, picked up from the texts on which the uh, algorithms are trained. Is this is a problem. Yeah, I would say, uh, well, this corresponds to what is in the data. So you made a good model of the data. If you want to play the guessing game, it's not a problem. You will be better at a guessing game if you're using this type of information, this type of semantic information. Um, however, if you use it to uh, screening your CV and predicting and finding out what is the perfect job for you, and then I would say this can become problematic. And because then we have, again, these correlations that we learned in order to play the guessing games, and which is not necessarily a, a causal relationship someone is not less capable for a job because uh, he or she is male or female, and, but maybe because of a lot of other characteristics that are correlated with it. And so we should be um, careful that our algorithms do not uh, pick this up. Um, I did myself a similar experiment um, where I just looked at the vector of words and then took the cosine similarity of uh, different words. And um, I took four groups of names so, uh, so personal names, and like, like uh, Tol in my case. Um, and I took the top 10 uh, most popular uh, white female names, top 10 most popular white male names, um, black uh, males and black female names. And uh, there are some lists available um, for, the, for the United States. And then I compute the average similarity and cosine similarity between the vectors. And then and for some uh, words that are there. And there you also see a very clear pattern and that is still present in the word embeddings uh, that are used and are available uh, nowadays. If you look, for instance, at robbery and the similarity with uh, black males, it's still, it's, it's, it's pretty low. And so that's, it's not that they're saying that every black male is a uh, criminal and, but it's much higher than for uh, white males. If you look at words like, uh, that are associated with, with qualities for a job, for instance, uh, intelligent, uh, professional, trustworthy, and there you typically see that males' uh, names score higher than female names. So uh, if you're screening CVs and you took out the gender of a person, but the name of the person is still in, uh, indirectly this may lead to the, this type of biases um, still being picked up. And uh, a, a lot of these um, embeddings, and they're available online 
for free so you can download them use them in your application that is what lots of people are doing and because training such an embedding or uh, a, a transformer um, if, if you look at more recent techniques is extremely complex and requires a lot of resources so it's it's very easy to download uh, an embedding from the internet and but then you should be uh, aware that these can contain some uh, biases that you need to account for uh, in the application that you're building. So this is the second example. And so where we again see that based on the data. And so here in the first one, there was label bias. Uh, here, the bias is more from because the data is taken uh, from a context where cultural bias is in the data, which is then indirectly picked up uh, by the algorithms. Uh, and the third case that I want to discuss is about um, machine bias. And this is more about measuring and uh, when do we say a system is fair uh, or isn't fair. So this third example is the COMPASS case and COMPASS uh, stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Altern uh, Alternative Sanctions. And this is a tool to predict the risk of recidivism um, in, um, in, in, in criminals or people that are brought uh, for court. And it can be used, for instance, uh, to make bail decisions. Uh, should we give a high bail, no bail, um, uh, etc.? And the label on which the algorithm was trained in order to make this risk prediction is whether or not there was a new arrest uh, within two years. Uh, the data was, uh, for instance, pending charges, prior arrest history, uh, pre-trial failure, uh, residential stability, also substance abuse uh, in, uh, in the family, um, parents that may uh, have been alcoholics, and all these type of characteristics were taken into account. And then the risk score was uh, given. Um, this is, of course, very controversial. And a uh, investigative um, team of journalists actually studied it. And this is the well-known ProPublica study. And they showed that the errors that were made by the model um, that was used in court, um, that they were highly biased. And here you can see in what way they were biased. So if you look at the mistakes that the model is making, then these mistakes tend to be in favor of the white defendants and uh, at, at the disadvantage of the black defendants. So here, for instance, in the first row, you see those that are labeled with a higher risk, but didn't reoffend. And so this is on simulated uh, data. Um, and so these were people that the system would have labeled as a higher risk. And then it turns out it didn't reoffend. And then we see that this mistake happens in 23% of the uh, white Americans and in 44.9% uh, of the uh, African Americans. And so a much higher rate here. And this is, of course, a type of mistake that you do not want to make because then, then you're keeping people in prison that actually deserve maybe a second chance. The second row is the opposite. And people that um, received lower risk but did not reoffend. And there we see that white people are more likely to receive this beneficial treatment than the uh, African Americans. Again, a mistake. Also, something you want to avoid. Um, and uh, again, a bias here. So, this is a, a very big problem, and that this very much discredited the uh, system. And so uh, you can ask, is this, is this model uh, unfair? Looking at the data from ProPublica, uh, everyone would immediately say, yes, it's unfair because the different populations are affected in a, in a different way, at a different rate. Uh, however, in North Point, this is a company that developed the algorithm. They defended themselves and they said, okay, maybe in the outcome in the end, there is a difference, but the scores are calibrated. And what does it mean calibrated? It means that if I give a score to a person, then how to interpret that score or that label that I'm giving to him, the way to interpret the label should not depend on whether you're uh, black or white. So if you get high risk, there is no black high risk and there is no white high risk. High risk means that you will be a recidivist here in this case in 75% uh, of the cases. It's not that this risk is much higher if you're black, or much higher if you're white. And so this is what is basically plotted in this graph. And for the three risk categories that they assign, you see of people that are in that risk category, which percentage is a recidivist. 
in an ideal world, 100% of the high category would be a recidivist and 0% in the low category. And, but in reality, it's more uh, dispersed. And here we see always the difference between the black population and the white population. And you see that these percentages are more or less the same. And so the way to interpret the label is not different, is not too much different. And if it's different, it's even pointing into the favor of the uh, black people. So then why, how come that North, that, that uh, ProPublica saw these large differences? So let's first make the situation similar to what we had in the uh, ProPublica study. So we don't have three categories, but you only have two categories. Uh, and let's say a, a high risk and a uh, low risk. And now let's look at mistakes that are uh, being made. Um, but before going to that, and there is another observation that is this line. And this line indicates the percentage of um, black people in these uh, different risk categories. And then you see that the black people are much more prevalent in the high risk category than they are in the low risk category. And so in the low risk category, it's like 50-50 white and uh, black defendants. High risk category, it's 80% black, 20% uh, white. And because of the demographics in the training data um, on which the algorithm was, uh, was trained. So if we now look at the mistakes that are being uh, made by our classifiers, and these mistakes are the things that are being reported by ProPublica, then you see that uh, that is still 20% of people that do not uh, recommit a crime, but that are in the high risk category. So there is 20% of people in this, this uh, group that receives a high risk label while they do not uh, deserve it. So this is a false positive. If you look at the two other groups, um, so in the low and medium risk, and so these are the ones that we will assign our low risk score, then we see it's a mistake in more than 50% for those in the medium category, then a mistake of 38%, let's say, in the uh, low risk category. So what we see here is that there are also lots of errors being made, but these are all false negatives. And this is exactly the, uh, the reason why we see these differences here, because uh, all false, false positives are in the high risk category. This was the first row in the ProPublica study. All false negatives are in the other groups. So that are the uh, green ones here. That was our second row in our ProPublica study. And then we see and that the black people are more present in those groups where all the false positives are and less present in those groups where the false negatives are. And so this is a, a, a possible explanation of the differences that you see in the uh, ProPublica study. So what does this mean? And what does this mean to be fair? And because both studies make sense. And then they raise some intriguing questions, like how can we define when a decision procedure is fair? If you look at it from with the glasses of ProPublica study, and then you would say, okay, this is unfair. If you look at it from the North Point uh, of view, they would say it's fair. So, uh, a first attempt that we could try is, okay, let, let's just forget about this um, um, ProPublica and North Point. What if we just remove ethnicity from our study? As we already saw in our first two examples, this is not necessarily a solution. In our hospitalization example, there was no ethnicity present. In our Amazon example, there was no uh, gender present. And this is because of the redlining effect. In most cases, there are lots and lots of other attributes that are correlated with our sensitive attribute that can be used to indirectly discriminate. Not because we intend to discriminate, but because of this existing correlation uh, that is not necessarily causal and that we do not want to see in our prediction. So that doesn't work. Just removing the ethnicity from our data doesn't work. So a second attempt could be, okay, and so there are two viewpoints of when something is fair. Let's just combine them. And let's require that both of them are uh, satisfied. So if you look at ProPublica, um, what they require, and they require that the mistakes that are made should be equal between black and white people. And this is what we call equal odds. 
And if you're talking about the high risk label, and this is equal opportunity. So basically, it's, they, they are saying that if you deserve to stay in prison, it shouldn't matter whether you're black or white. And so the probability of getting the high label, given that you are a reoffender, offender shouldn't depend on uh, being black or white. If you deserve to be released, it shouldn't matter whether you're black or white. And the probability of getting the low risk label should not depend, uh, if you're not, not a reoffender. of course, it should be depend on that, uh, but should not depend on uh, your ethnicity. So put mathematically, the probability of receiving the positive label by our classifier, and so y hat is our prediction, uh, given your true class is, and you're, you're truly a, uh, a criminal, uh, then it should not depend, it should be equal independently if A is zero or A is one, A is the sensitive attribute and the ethnicity in this case. And similarly for our second row, and so that's what ProPublica is saying. What North Point is saying is, almost exactly the same if you look at the formulas, but the role of Y and Y hat is switched. And so basically they're saying, if you look at the categories, so the, the risk categories in which I assign people and the risk category should, um, how you should interpret that should not depend on your ethnicity. So the probability of having a uh, truly being criminal if you were assigned the label high risk should be the same independently of your uh, ethnicity. So let's try to combine both of them because both of them make sense. And I think you know, th th there are things to say about each um, a classifier that violates either of them. So if you want to make it calibrated, and so suppose uh, we have our uh, two communities, people are divided in low risk, high risk, um, they get, and there are some people that recommit crimes, some that do not, and so positive versus negative. So basically what we can do, if you adapt our classifier, we can move points of uh, predictions for points and from left to right. So, so this uh, positive point, ideally we would move it to the high risk category. Um, and uh, each classifier will on our test data result in this, this kind of image. Some of them will be incorrectly be predicted to be low risk. Uh, these are correctly predicted. Some will be incorrectly be predicted to be high risk. To be calibrated means that hey, it doesn't matter whether you're, sorry, this was too quick, whether you're uh, black or white, that the percentage of wrong predictions should be, should be the same. One third is incorrect. One third and two out of six is incorrect here. Uh, in this case, two out of three are incorrect. Or, um, and here, um, so one out of three is incorrect. Two out of three are correct two out of three are correctly uh, as a positive label. So this is a calibrated classifier. If you look at the equal opportunity, this is not satisfied. Because if you deserve the high risk label, and so you're a plus, four out of five uh, actually get the high risk label. For the white people, it's only half of them. And then and for the negative label, uh, it's half uh, is in the high risk category, and here only one out of five. So it's not uh, equal opportunity, but calibrated. So basically what we can try to do now is we can try to move, uh, change our classifier, change our classifier may move some points from left to right. And let's now try to make them uh, equal opportunity. So we start moving around until we reach an equilibrium. So an equilibrium would be, uh, uh, or a um, uh, equal odds, uh, one situation that ProPublica is happy about, is that there exists X and Y, such that if both for black and for white people, the probability of being in the high risk if you're positive is X, and the probability of being in the high risk if you're uh, truly negative is Y. So if you look at the number of positive and negative examples that we get, uh, so we have the total number of positive uh, people in the first community times X, so that will be the ones that end up in this uh, risk category and uh, say there are 100 that have the positive label, 90% of those with the positive label end up in the high risk category. And so this means P1 times X, 90 people with the positive label are here. Similarly for the negative label, uh, and here we have exactly the same formulas, uh, but for people of the second community. So there might be different proportions that there might be different number of people with the positive label and people with the negative label. For the low risk category, it's the same now. It's just because X percent is present here, 100% uh, minus X percent is present in the low risk category. 
uh, what does it mean if it should be calibrated at the same time? Then it also means that these proportions need to be the same. This proportion of uh, the number of um, people with a positive label versus the number of people with a negative label should be the same for the black as for the uh, white people. And here also the same. Now, if you um, look at this mathematically, the only way that this is possible is either if x is zero and y is equal to one, or if x is one and y is equal to zero, or if p1 over n1 is equal to p2 over n2, because then uh, if these two are equal, then that's the case. So what does this mean in reality? How can we interpret this? Uh, it means that both together can only be realized in very exceptional conditions. Either we get perfect predictability, perfect predictability that was the case, x is equal to one, y is equal to zero. This means if you deserve the positive label, there is 100% probability that you will get the high risk category. And there is 0% probability that you will get it if you uh, are truly have a negative label. This is of course, as we all know, running uh, machine learning experiments. This is an extremely unrealistic situation. And so this is a picture from the movie Minority Report and where they developed such a system which is 100% uh, accurate and they just lock up criminals and before they can even commit a crime. This is luckily uh, not the case and uh, we have no perfect predictability. The other case is if we have equal base rates and so our P1 over N1 is equal to P2 over N2, which basically means that both communities are the same with respect to uh, criminality. Now, in this particular compass case, and this was not true, uh, which means that unless um, North Point can build a, a perfect classifier, uh, it will always have this uh, issue that it will violate either the ProPublica requirements or the uh, North Point requirements. So to conclude about these uh, measures, there is no universal definition of fairness. And it's always uh, situation dependent. Um, is this bad news? And does this mean that whatever we do, we can never be fair? Um, I don't think that is the case. And let me explain a little bit more about this uh, situation dependent. And that has to do with this uh, accuracy fairness uh, trade-off. It's a common assumption that the most accurate fair model should always be less accurate than the most accurate model. And this totally makes sense. And because, okay, uh, on the one hand, you're picking out of all possible models and you pick the most accurate model out of those versus I'm restricting myself, my, the model that I learned needs to be fair, either according to ProPublica or to uh, the North Point definition. There are less models that I can pick from. And so the most accurate one there will be uh, a less fair model. However, uh, recently it has been uh, shown and intuitively it's also clear and that in case of label bias and, and in many cases of bias, actually it turns out that fair models may, be, may, act, may be more accurate than unfair, uh, unfair models. Um, so uh, what we need to do in order to resolve our solution, uh, in order to resolve the situation, in my opinion, and that is basically the closing statement of um, my presentation also, and that we do not need to, uh, to optimize accuracy on tainted training data while trying to keep one of these fairness measures um, in uh, high. Uh, but uh, we can also look at the problem as trying to optimize expected accuracy for fair uh, test data. So we um, just may, by making some assumptions that our training data uh, is unfair, might have a uh, bias, and we can basically, um, fair machine learning is not about learning a politically correct classifier um, and that, that might be less accurate and because of being politically correct, and but is basically based on some deep convictions that we have. Males and females are equally capable of doing uh, jobs. Blacks and whites are equally capable of, um, uh, of, of uh, not committing crimes. Uh, and uh, on the basis of that, we try to learn a classifier that will optimize the expected accuracy for uh, fair this data. So uh, to conclude, I hope I have um, convinced you that machine learning, uh, learning models are not fair out of the box. 
if biased data goes in and biased decisions, biased decision procedures may uh, come out. Uh, fairness is about how to build models that optimally avoid certain types of bias. I couldn't go, go into uh, too much detail of how these algorithms work, but you can always ask a question about it if you're interested in that. Uh, and this problem is partly inherent to decision making. It's not uh, only for AI. And equal base rates between groups provably lead to differences in treatment uh, between communities. Uh, and fair models, however, uh, can be more accurate than unfair models if you take into account that there is bias in uh, your training data. Voila, so this uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention.